if you use the example of UPS, here's a company that begins in 1907 in Seattle as a bicycle messenger service. So how is it that 125 years later, how is it that, you know, it is a global corporation employing half a million workers, flies to 220 countries and territories a day, has a massive delivery fleet of 60,000 package cars. It has to tell us about something that changed with manufacturing and distribution over the last, the last century. Now, you the word logistics has somewhat of an impersonal ring to it. When you hear it, you think massive container ships, cranes, 18-wheelers, aircrafts, conveyor belts, spreadsheets, contracts, and of course, boxes. It's almost as if all of this infrastructure that moves our goods around the world, around the clock, is running by itself. The wonders of technology. But undergirding logistics is one indispensable element. Workers. Millions of them without whom the colossal flow of goods and services would come grinding to a halt. Hello, my name is Teddy Ostro. Welcome to The Upsurge, a podcast about UPS, the Teamsters, and the future of the American labor movement. This podcast unpacks the unprecedented labor fight this year at UPS. In July, the contract of over 340,000 UPS workers will expire. And if those workers go on strike, which is a real possibility, it will be the largest strike against a single company in U.S history. The Upsurge is produced in partnership with In These Times and The Real News Network. Both are nonprofit media organizations that cover the labor movement closely. Check them out at InTheseTimes.com and TheRealNews.com, where you can also find an archive of all our past episodes. And now for our episodic plea. Please remember we are an entirely listener-supported podcast. We don't play ads. We depend on you to keep the show going. So if you like the show, please become a supporter of our Patreon at patreon.com slash upsurgepod. You can find the link in the description. Thank you to our over 50 patrons so far. You are the reason why we can do this work. But frankly, we are not sustainable at our current funding level, which is why we are starting a patron drive to reach 200 monthly supporters of our Patreon by July so that we can sustain and improve our work. I'm sorry for this long plea, but this podcast takes a huge amount of labor. To give you an idea, this takes incalculable hours of reporting, talking to dozens of UPSers to understand what's going on, conducting interviews, research, lots of writing, and we pay our co-producer Ruby Walsh to help develop episode ideas to do a huge lift in piecing together all the audio for our scripts. She reviews drafts. She is incredible. And I don't want to even get started on how many hours it takes to edit these episodes. They sound good for a reason. It takes time. It takes money. We have to pay for audio software, mics, all the equipment, etc. So please, we need your help. Even if you support us with $5 a month, it will go a very long way. And thankfully, we do have some wonderful incentives. For example, the next 36 people who become our Patreon supporters will receive a free one-year subscription to In These Times magazine, one of the best publications covering the labor movement today. Also, depending on your tier of patronage, you may receive exclusive content like the research that goes into the show and bonus episodes, which, trust me, you do not want to miss them. We just posted one where Ruby and I attended the picket lines of the writer's strike happening right now. Soon we're posting an interview that digs into women's experience at UPS. There's a lot you're missing if you're not a patron of the podcast. Okay, no more begging. On to episode 7 of The Upsurge. Hairspray for Houston, dog food for Dallas, samples to Sydney, a contract for Kansas. Sorting parcels seem so simple. The goods come in, they're sorted, and then they leave. But when your warehouse is bigger than 90 football fields and you're handling 2 million packages a day, there's no room for a snooze at the UPS Worldport Hub in Kentucky. You can hear the CNN newscaster's awe with the truly breathtaking infrastructure of UPS's Worldport Air Hub in Louisville, Kentucky. 
Assisted by 155 miles of conveyor belt, 20,000 UPSers work here. Loading and unloading trucks at the facility's 70 aircraft docks where millions of packages are delivered to more than 220 countries and territories around the world. The head-spinning operations at Worldport make clear that UPS is not simply a package delivery company, but a multinational logistics corporation. Some of us may remember UPS's ad campaign a decade ago with the tagline, We Love Logistics. In this episode of The Upsurge, we're zooming out and looking at UPS within a larger process that has occurred over the last several decades, the logistics revolution. The Teamsters, a union founded in 1903, has come a long way since its humble origins representing workers who drove carriages pulled by teams of horses. That story is one of gradual but gargantuan changes in the global economy the modernization of production and distribution. That is, a revolution in how goods are transported to markets and how goods are then sold to consumers. But it's also a story of changes in how workers are organized and managed by both their unions and their companies. I could think of no better person to talk about this than Joe Allen, a historian, activist, and truck driver who was a UPS teamster for almost a decade. He is a contributor to the online publication Tempest and the author of The Package King, a rank-and-file history of the United Parcel Service published by Haymarket Books. Now, I just want to say that the upsurge is seriously indebted to Joe Allen and his work. So much of my personal learning came from the Package King and from talking with Joe directly. And I know I'm not alone in that. I really think if you want to understand the importance of the Teamsters contract campaign this year, there's no better resource than the Package King. And this episode is based on a chapter in the book, which is why I was so excited to finally bring Joe on the show to discuss some of the history of UPS as a company, how it fits into the larger logistics revolution in American capitalism, and also how the Teamsters fit into that process, too. As Joe makes clear, the rise of logistics in the global economy has also meant the rise of workers' potential for wielding serious economic, political, and social power. The Teamsters campaign is one major juncture on the road to worker power. I hope you'll learn from Joe as much as I have. Joe Allen, welcome to The Upsurge. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So someone should probably file a grievance against me for not getting you on the show sooner. Uh, (laughs) Your work has really inspired us, and I'm really excited to chat with you on the show. To get started, I'd like to ask a deceivingly simple question. What is logistics? I feel like the pandemic injected this phrase into our psyches, our everyday conversations, as well as uh, the phrase supply chain. Mm -hmm. Can you explore that concept for us? Well, I think uh, it's become a buzzword, you know, that on one hand, if you say it, you know, it implies that everybody knows what you're talking about. And to some degree, you know, the idea behind it is pretty simple and pretty basic and it's most simple form. It's, you know, how do you get goods and goods that are produced to consumers? I mean, you know, from the plant, the manufacturing facility to the people who have bought it at the end of the day. Um, and that's still, in some sense, the, uh, the basic idea of logistics. Though for some people, at least, it has a kind of military ring to it, you know, like it, it always did. And that's not an accident. But I think the, the modern discussion of logistics is on a much grander scale. It really is talking about the organization of entire supply chains, which has, you know, occurred for two reasons. One, technological changes, that is modern air fleets, containerization, the vast expansion of ocean transport, the vast expansion of trucking. I mean, all these things come together, but it also means a kind of reorganization of production that allowed for the emergence of, in particular, these kind of enormous retail giants, Walmart being the kind of trendsetter for this starting in the late 60s through the 70s and then, you know, becoming a massive corporation uh, during the course of the 1990s being one of the largest private sector employers in the country, which it remains today. And of course, you know, Amazon, which is both, you know, brings together both being a delivery company and a retail operation, 
At the same time, this also applies to the big transportation giants. So companies that, you know, don't provide goods or, you know, like an Amazon or a Walmart, like UPS, FedEx, DHL, and of course, still, you know, major post offices in the United States and other countries uh, have emerged as major players and major employers. And they sell themselves to major corporations as not just people who just deliver your goods, but they can organize your whole supply chain from where something is manufactured through how it's distributed. And in the case of the big retail giants, over the years, what they've tried to do is cut out more and more and more middlemen. So, you know, the supply chains themselves have become lean, to use another buzz phrase. Uh, So they're exchanged with fewer and fewer hands, and they move quicker and quicker across the globe. The one thing, of course, that I think has sort of changed since the COVID-19 pandemic is that the global supply chain, which were really kind of, you know, seen as the model for modern industrial production and distribution, it's clear that the breakdown of the global manufacturing and distribution caused by the COVID pandemic means that there's going to be a reassessing. And, or, and, it, and in some sense, we've begun to see this reassessing of where production takes place. So the reshoring of a lot of manufacturing that used to take place overseas back in the United States and what this could mean for manufacturing employment, I think we're only at the very beginning of, but I think we have, we have turned a corner on that. So there's, you know, where we were before the pandemic and there's where we were after the pandemic. But I think, you know, at the center of either of these eras is the emergence of these really huge, large retail corporations, Walmart, Amazon, Home Depot, I mean, Target, pick your, pick your company. And, um, and the various, you know, transport companies, whether they be UPS, FedEx, DHL, uh, and a whole array of what we call freight, the industrial working class and the industrial labor movement, which went through from the 70s, really through the late 90s, went through this gut-wrenching changes where unions such as the old Teamsters and the UAW and the steel workers and, you know, related industrial unions who were seen at the heart of the industrial working class really were hollowed out by those vast changes in production in particular. And now we've seen, you know, a kind of regrouping of industrial workers in large workplaces, particularly in the big distribution companies like Amazon or UPS. So the potential for building a new industrial labor movement is here. The question is, you know, can it be done by the existing unions or do themselves have to be really changed fundamentally to take advantage of it, or do we have to create new ones? I mean, I think that's really the big questions out there, and I don't think we have an answer to that yet. Well, part of the goal of this podcast, right, is to sort of unpack what brought us to this moment um, when 350,000 Teamsters could shut down a massive pillar of U.S. logistics, UPS. And you dove into this history already a little bit, but let's go back a little bit further in time and describe this longer process that could be called the logistics revolution. Can you help us understand what was that? What is that? And more specifically, how do these courier companies with an emphasis on UPS, how do they fit into that process? Well, you know, if you look at it, if you use the example of UPS, here's a company that begins in 1907 in Seattle as a bicycle messenger service. So how is it that 125 years later, How is it that, you know, it is a global corporation employing half a million workers, flies to 220 countries and territories a day, has a massive delivery fleet of 60,000 package cars. I mean, it has to tell us about something that changed with, uh, you know, manufacturing and distribution over the last, the last century. Now, UPS in particular for a long time was a kind of, you know, as I describe it, a kind of boutique delivery service. You know, it oriented mostly on department stores. When people would go in, there was a certain glamour to shopping. I don't think anybody thinks shopping is glamorous anymore, Uh, or and and hasn't been for a very long time. But people used to go to the glamour of shopping, and part of that was that department stores would wrap your packages, and you wouldn't take them home. And you would be handed off to UPS in many of the big cities. And the UPS would then, a day or two later, would deliver these to your home. And that went on for a very long time. And UPS was very good at it. 
In fact, UPS, you know, starts out on the West Coast and then in the 1930s makes a leap to New York City. You know, it buys out a lot of local delivery companies or just kind of takes over their contracts with many of the big department stores. And that's what kind of UPS was known for, for, you know, for the first quarter century of its uh, existence. What happens really is World War II. And you have a global war in which, you know, the major powers of the world, all of whom are major industrial powers, launch a war for, you know, who's going to be the dominant power, the dominant coalition of powers. And that requires production, the moving of goods, and the moving of armies all across the globe. So this really produces a kind of revolution in thinking about the role of distribution and shipping for warfare that you saw some of which with World War I, but it's on a much grander scale with World War II. And after World War II, much of this, you know, new thinking was brought into the business world. Now, this didn't all happen overnight. You know, if you go back and look at what the United States looked like at the end of, of World War II, you know, it had its ports were pretty backward. There was no GPS. There was no barcode. There were no computers. You know, there was no satellite information system. Containerization was just a thought in some people's heads. There was no auto industry for, you know, on that scale that later became after the war. Trucking exploded. And so a, a lot of this stuff are parts of the puzzle kind of working their way towards a common goal, but in a very herky-jerky fashion. So it's really in the 1960s and 1970s that some of the technological changes, the growth of an interstate highway system, this new level of air and ocean transport create the possibility of really reorganizing production on both a global scale and also quickening the pace of getting goods from the plants and manufacturing facilities into the hands of uh, in the hands of consumers and in a lot of ways Walmart becomes the model for that you know uh, Sam Walmart took what was a fairly small regional company and turned it into a kind of massive American style corporate entity with the idea of trying to cut, keep cutting out the middlemen so that he could then sell products as cheaply as possible. He became very successful at that. And that was later taken over and extended on a different level by Amazon. During this time, of course, UPS goes from being a boutique delivery service to slowly but surely becoming a 48 and then 50 state corporation. Because remember, one of the things about the New Deal is that the New Deal tightly regulated the trucking industry for you know a period of 40 years. It dampened competition. It microscopically organized the industry, which created both stable jobs. And it was something that the Teamsters Union relied upon for creating a stable industry and allowed them to grow to be really the dominant force in the trucking industry. I mean, they had 2 million members by the late 60s, early 70s. Most trucking companies were tiny compared to it. But underneath what this surface, you know, and this is one of the things that I think I would say to people is, you know, in any period of time, there are the things you see, the things you partially see, and the much bigger historical forces that you don't really see in the background, but are animating something else that's that's going to produce a, a big change. And of course, during the 1960s, the Teamsters kind of reached the height of their bargaining power under Hoffer, Hoffer the first, with the National Master Freight Agreement. And UPS is still a fairly, you know, is a growing company, but on the edge of the freight industry. Underneath all that, there are these big changes going on uh, that the union's partially aware of, but partially ignoring, you know, at the same at the same time. And during the course of the 1970s and 1980s, what happens is that there's a big push to deregulate the trucking, finance, air, and leads to this massive reorganization of the uh, trucking industry in particular, that UPS, which had become known as kind of the quiet giant of the freight industry, uh, explodes from, you know, the late 60s employing about 100,000 people to by the late 1990s, employing nearly 200,000, well, Teamsters, and uh, positions itself for even further growth over the next few years. So one of the things that makes UPS different is that it had a fairly uniform system of what it took for packages, what were called parcel post, but they had a national system 
for you know bringing them in, distributing them, and so forth. It was a very streamlined, very focused business. And they did it very well. And they basically created a situation where of all the people who benefited from deregulation, they were one of the major benefactors from that, uh, starting in the 1980s. At the same time, what made them an anomaly, an oddball in all of this, is that they were a union company. Uh, most of the modern big, you know, transport and, and, and retail companies are non-union. You know, the older logistics industry, waterfront, rail, are union. They're highly regulated, but they're union. Most of the current modern ones are non-union. So UPS inhabits this kind of odd space of both being one of the great benefactors of deregulation and being a unionized company at the same time. And so, you know, what this means politically is that within the Teamsters, they've become a kind of union within a union. You know, right now there are anywhere from 330,000 to 350,000, depending on seasonal fluctuation, UPSers who are members of the Teamsters Union. The Teamsters have about 1.2 million members. So over a quarter of the union are UPSers in some sense, even though the Teamsters have national contracts with other trucking companies. There's nothing that compares to the size and importance of, of, of UPS. So they've become heavily dependent on it. And throughout most of their history, but also their modern history, unfortunately, you know, the Teamsters have had a cooperative relationship with the company. So in exchange for concessions, particularly, you know, the difference between the pay for part-timers and full-timers, and part-timers still make up nearly two-thirds of the workforce, they've helped subsidize the massive growth of, of UPS at every stage of the way during its modern history, and I mean that from the 1980s onward, uh, really quite at the expense particularly of, of part-timers in terms of wages, but also in terms of the working conditions that, whether you're full-time or, or part-time, are, are quite horrendous and exploitative. So during this time, we've seen this, re you know, this kind of retail revolution. We've seen a, a logistics revolution. We've also seen something of revolution in labor relations where the teams are both declined in terms of its presence overall, but have grown more dependent on UPS to be a viable national union, which creates all sorts of contradictory pressures, both on the union and within it. That's a really good point. And I want to dig more into the Teamsters in a few minutes. But first, you sort of began to mention this. We can't do this podcast without talking about the pandemic. What has the pandemic done for UPS? And I think also this may be a good time to bring in how Amazon fits into this landscape? Well, I mean, I think the one thing that the pandemic did is it accelerated trends that already existed. Um, so, you know, on a global scale, it accelerated the kind of rivalry between the United States and, and China in particular. I think the other is, is that I think since, 19, since uh, 2018, um, and this obviously accelerated during the pandemic, is that both Amazon and UPS, I'm sure this is true of FedEx and others also, the, their, their workforces have substantially expanded. One of the things, of course, that the pandemic did is it meant that during the first year, but I think it's been true overall, is that more people were simply at home and that they had to order online for the things that they would have previously gone to local shops or, you know, department stores or supermarkets to get. You know, even companies like Walmart and Target and others who are still have a substantial brick and mortar presence had to shift towards making more and more home deliveries of their products. So, you know, I think since 2018, UPS claims that they've put on 50,000 more workers, most of whom are, you know, our Teamster members. At the same time, we should recognize that, you know, both Amazon and UPS uh, the turnover rate, particularly among part-timers, you know, is is incredible. I mean, some there are some estimates that if you look at it annually, there's something like a 90% turnover rate. And I, I'll tell you, Teddy, that, you know, going back to as somebody who was around the 1997 strike and has written about it, when, you know, the union achieved a hands-down victory with creating 10,000 new jobs out of existing part-time positions, right? Because that was the key phrase for that one. If you were to tell me 25 years later that the model for the logistics industry was a 90% annual turnover rate, 
uh, for part timers. I just would have thought, you know, you were you were crazy, and yet they've been able to do that and sustain that model for all these years, and that creates real organizing problems for whether it's Amazon or organizing an existing union workforce like UPS. Is that if you have so many people who feel, you know, who leave on, come and go on such a constant basis, that creates a very difficult situation for organizing. Yeah, I think in general, when we think about logistics, right, we don't think about people and the workers, people you're talking about who are making these things run. You get the sense that these processes of moving things around the world are almost like automated. Mm -hmm. You know, everything's on a belt, sorted by machines, but people or, or labor does have an enormous role in this that you've touched on. So maybe more broadly, we can talk about, you know, how does labor fit into this process that you've been describing um, over the last hundred years? And specifically, how do the Teamsters fit into it? Well, I think the thing is, is that, you know, we can always, I think in general, there's a, the way that people like ourselves, you know, people who see themselves as socialists or labor activists and so forth, you know, we shouldn't fear technology because, you know, from our perspective, technology should always be used to do away with the most dangerous of work, you know, to do away with drudgery, things that could lead to illness or injury. You know, that, that, that's the promise of technology. Of course, the problem is that being in the hands of the capitalist class, it's used for increasing exploitation and surveillance. I mean, that's, that's where the, you know, our, you know, most of the people we deal with every day and, and union workers deal with is because every time you hear technology, it either means I'm going to lose a job or I'm just going to get screwed over more and more. And of course, that's the reality for many people. I think when you look back over the last 100 years and, you know, the last 50 years, is that there's a couple of things to keep in mind, is that while technology can be used and it can be devastating in particular jobs, you know, like the mining industry or and things like that, is that much of the talk of, of, of technology just wiping out whole workforces has really proven not to be true time and time and time again. And that doesn't mean specific jobs, you know, or specific things, you know. But I think overall what we see is that labor is, you know, the actual hands-on project products is, you know, workers are more important than, than ever before. I mean, I think that's the, that's the thing. It's, it's not really about technology replacing workers overall. It's about technology being used to exploit people more and more, right? So I think today when you look at even whatever process goes on, is that whether you're a UPS feeder driver or a package car driver doing a pickup at one end of the day, you know, one, those are people picking up packages and driving trucks. You know, it goes into a warehouse where they have to be unloaded by people unloading trucks to people who are sorters who are then sorting them into, you know, trailers for another hub, or they're being sorted to be loaded onto trucks, uh, you know, 10 or, you know, five to 10 hours later in those very same buildings who then have to be driven out by drivers who have to hand them to businesses and workers. So workers are still absolutely essential to all the system. Um, Though, of course, you know, one of the things that UPS tries to do, as well as other major companies, is to try to introduce as much technology as possible to kind of minimize the amount of hands on packages, so to to speak. And yet today, you know, you look back, you know, and you go in, uh, in 1968, you know, UPS delivered more parcel posts in the post office. It had about 100,000 employees at the time. When Ron Carey, you know, led the strike against UPS in 1997, there was 185,000 Teamsters went out on strike. Here we are, you know, 25 years later, quarter of a century later, and despite all the talk of technology and replacing workers, there are something like 330,000 to 350,000 workers who are members of the Teamsters Union at UPS. So, you know, I think that the potential power of workers to, to shut down UPS, one has been demonstrated, though it has been muted and, and underused. And we'll see come July 31st whether it's used for the first time in the modern history of UPS, which I mean modern may now mean since 2000, so, you know, for history purposes. Well, let's bring the conversation more specifically now to the UPS Teamsters contract campaign. I've asked a couple times on this show what a Teamsters strike would mean for the broader labor movement. And I'd, I'd like to ask you the same question, but perhaps you can emphasize why it's so significant that this is happening or could happen in the logistics industry. What are the potentials we're seeing here? 
Well, I think that the, right now, and maybe we won't really know until mid-July, you know, the national contract between the Teamsters and UPS doesn't end until July 31st. So maybe when we won't really know until mid-July where, where things are completely at. But I think there's obviously a different model that UPS wants to impose on its workforce that the, that the Teamsters rightly are resisting, you know, what people call the Uberization or the digitizing of the UPS workforce. They want a much more casual workforce, something that doesn't have, you know, right now what the heart and guts of the union are, particularly package car drivers who have fairly well-defined wages and benefits and working schedules. The Hoffa administration last time around made a series of concessions about creating a lower tier full-time package car driver and a, a several other concessions about personal vehicles and contingent workers during some parts of the year that rightly inflamed a lot of people, which is why the contract was voted down, but then undemocratically imposed on the membership. UPS is a, is a very important corporation because on a daily basis, it moves something like 2 to 3% of the global economy something like 6% of the UPS GDP. FedEx does a similar amount. So these are these are really important corporations. You know, UPS was a trendsetter in labor relations, both in terms of being its, its kind of internal, you know, repressive culture and the concessions wrangled out of the Teamsters in the early 1980s then kind of went across the, the board for workforces and unions. UPS today you know, is is so ubiquitous. It's hard to think of a country without it. You know, I mean, it's just present and necessary for so many people. And, you know, the Teamsters under Hoffa, the previous two decades under Hoffa, kind of, you know, you went from kind of a high point of the Teamsters in 1997, where Ron Carey was the leader of this reform movement. The Teamsters, this big strike that kind of seemed to herald the rebirth of the American labor movement. And then found himself witch hunted out of the union in this kind of almost semi coup that the federal government helped bring Jim Hoffa to power. The teams has then sunk back into this very predictable and languishing position for, for two decades. And so the last couple of years, one of the things the pandemic produced was how absolutely essential, particularly industrial workers and truck drivers were. And we've seen something of a strike wave in industrial America starting about two years ago. And, you know, the the old guard leadership split and Sean O'Brien and Fred Zuckerman came to power with a promise to for a change in the fundamental direction of the Teamsters. And the Teamsters, you know, are, are both important in terms of what they are as a union, but they're also kind of culturally important, you know, sometimes not for the best of reasons uh, in terms of Hollywood movies and films. But everybody knows the Teamsters. I mean, you know, so it's hard not to kind of find someone who goes, I don't know anything about the Teamsters. I mean, everybody knows something about the Teamsters. So a strike at UPS not only has the potential of putting into motion, you know, something like 340,000 workers and shutting down a very important corporation, it has the possibility of kind of elevating the struggles that we've already begun to see throughout the industrial section of the economy and some of the new organizing and and the possibility of of kind of injecting that spirit and organizing into the you know the the larger non-union section of the, the logistics industry most notably amazon but we shouldn't forget about uh about FedEx and, and a lot of the big major trucking companies so i think people tend to be attracted not to necessarily the specifics of any contract settlement, because, you know, companies can be very different in terms of job classifications and pays. What they're attracted to is a sense that there's a union that's fighting and moving forward. So if we do see the type of, you know, struggle that could take place, and I, I still lean towards the, the, there being a strike right now, I don't think anything has changed with that, that it could really capture the imagination of people who really want a union but they want to join something that that they feel is fighting fighting for them, and uh, that's the potential of, of what could happen on July thirty first. So I think we all agree that a Teamster victory at UPS would be pretty huge. But looking beyond the Teamsters, what do you think is needed to expand organizing and to build power in that industry, including on the rails and the air on the docks, just across? logistics well I, I I still think that you know there's there's many things that need to be needed I think one of the things about the rail contract dispute last fall 
is that for the first time, at least in, in my political life, that discussions of the conditions in the rail industry and the rail unions were, were national news for several months. I mean, that was extraordinary in and of itself. Now, part of that was because the working conditions of rail workers, I think, was shocking to most people. Because if there's one industry in the country that's had unions for over 100 years, uh, it's, it's the rail industry. And so I myself found it shocking. But it also goes to show you that, you know, the labor laws that existed in this country, specifically the Railway Labor Act, but this is also true of Taft-Hartley, which governs most private sector uh, or, uh, industry, is highly repressive and really is used to kind of squelch, squash the fights that we need to kind of make, make things better. But we're not going to get really labor law reform until we have, you know, millions of more workers who are not only in unions, but are also prepared to fight for that type of political agenda. I keep coming back to some of the lessons from the 1930s and the 1970s is that there's always going to be sentiment to fight. and We'll always see workers prepared to kind of take action to do stuff. But we also need, you know, people with radical politics, whether you want to call that socialism or communism or syndicalism. Who have a broader vision of how you how you want to shape the labor movement and 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 move it forward and to, and to overcome, you know, a lot of the divisions that exist within the labor movement. You know, the trade unions now and exist in the broader working class. I mean, one of the reasons why UPS is so successfully over the decades been able to kind of push through a lot of these concessions is not just having a compliant leadership but having a highly divided membership. I mean, there are a few workplaces, or particularly a unionized workplace, like UPS, where you have on one hand, extremely highly paid, you know, feeder drivers, you know, traditional semi-drivers outside. That's the lingo for UPS feeder drivers. Best working conditions, probably you can get as a truck driver through a myriad of jobs down to the lowliest duly hired part-timer unloading trucks in the middle of the night in the middle of nowhere. And trying to bring that kind of highly divided, very disparate workforce where issues of race and gender, you know, intersect and immigration status intersect and weave them way through all these issues into one group of people who can fight around common demands is not an easy task. It was achieved in 1997. And that's one thing that we, you know, we need to happen now. But that just reflects, I think, the broader divisions that exist within the American working class in any major industry, in any major trucking or transport company. And so we need people who have a political vision of that a labor movement is just not about wages and working conditions, but it's also about fighting racism and sexism and fighting against anti-immigrant bigotry or transphobia. You know, and, and there's just too much of the labor movement will either kind of sign off on, yeah, we're all for the fight for the right things, or they'll completely ignore those things. But those are the things that actually divide or and potentially can unite workers on a daily basis in a workplace. And that lack of imagination, that lack of politics is still is still kind of, you know, marginal to the labor movement right right now. And I think that's one of the things that has to change. Joe Allen, thanks for joining me on The Upsurge. Thanks a lot, Teddy. Glad to be here. You just listened to episode seven of The Upsurge. What didn't make it into this episode, but I think is important to note, is that there are complicated and contradictory relationships between all of the logistics giants mentioned in this episode. For example, UPS and Amazon both rely heavily on the U.S. Postal Service to deliver a large number of their products. In many ways, exploiting a beloved public institution that has suffered political attack over the decades which has created the opportunity for these private companies to expand so rapidly. Meanwhile, Amazon is UPS's biggest customer. UPS delivers a huge portion of Amazon parcels, even as it fears the exponential growth of Amazon's own delivery infrastructure. So while there's competition between these companies, Joe emphasized to me that there's also significant cooperation. And because of that, workers at each stop on the supply chain, at each logistics pillar, have remarkable leverage against the whole system. The power of these workers is immense, and right now we are watching how the Teamsters will choose to wield it.
The Upsurge is produced in partnership with In These Times and The Real News Network. Both are nonprofit media organizations that cover the labor movement closely. Check them out at InTheseTimes.com and TheRealNews.com, where you can find an archive of all our past episodes. You can also show your support by sharing the episode on social media, giving us a five-star rating, and writing a review. Follow us on Twitter at Upsurge Pod and Facebook The Upsurge. You can also listen to us on our YouTube channel, The Upsurge. But the best way to show your support is by becoming a patron of the show at patreon.com slash upsurge pod. We are listeners supported and can't continue without you. Please help us reach our goal of 200 monthly subscribers by July. You can find a link in the description. Thank you to all our Patreon supporters, but a very special thank you and shout out to our patrons at the business agent tier or higher. Greg Kerwood, Emil McDonald, Yoni Golojov, Jason Cohn, Jason Mendez, Richard Hooker, Tony Winters, David Allen, Justin Allo, Tim Peppers, Dan Arlen, Dimitri Legas, Juliet Kang, Rand Wilson, Randy Ostro, Mac Harden, Timothy Kruger, Nicole Halliday, D. Bo, Ed Laskowski, and Chris Schleicher. All of your support means so much. The podcast was edited by myself. It was produced by NYGP and Ruby Walsh. Music is by Casey Gallagher. The cover art was done by Devlin Clara Resitar. I'm Teddy Ostro. Thanks for listening and catch you next time.